So we can start, Roji. It is eight o'clock now. Yes. You want me to speak the Mangalacharan? I can speak the Mangalacharan and then hand over to you, Roji. In the Mangalacharan, when you say Om Agyana, it's not Om Agyana. It's Om Agyana. Okay. There's A. <laughs> Om Agnana Timirandasya Gnananjana Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padantikam one day, Ham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishaka Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Tina Bandhu Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo 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 Stute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Shabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakal Patarubhyascha Ripa se vacha patitana pavane pyo vaishnave pyo namo nama Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Kadadhara Shri Vasadi Kaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Prabhuji done with Pranam. Please accept our humble obeisances on behalf of everybody who has joined the group and are about to join and will be listening to this session online later on. Prabhuji, we are reading the Srimad Bhagavatam and we are um on Canto 2 and our chapter, we have started a new chapter today, Chapter 8, which is Questions by King Parikshit and the text for today is Text 1. Prabhuji, I hand over to you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. So the text 1, the Sanskrit is as follows. Rajo vacha brahmana chodito brahman gunakhyana gunashicha Yashmai Yashmai Yata Praha Narado Deva Darshana Translation King Parikshit inquired from Sukhdeva Swami How did Narad Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma, explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord, who is without material qualities, and before whom did he speak? Okay, brother, you can read the purport. Purport by Shri Prabhupada, the Prabhupada Ki Jai. Devarshi Narad was directly instructed by Brahmaji, who was also directly instructed by the Supreme Lord. Therefore, the instructions imparted by Narada to his various disciples are as good as those of Supreme Lord. This is the way of understanding Vedic knowledge. It comes down from the Lord by disciplinic succession, and this transcendental knowledge is distributed to the world by this descending process. There is no chance, however, to receive the Vedic knowledge from mental speculators. Therefore, whenever Narad Muni goes, he represents himself as authorized by the Lord 
and his appearance is as good as that of the Supreme Lord. Similarly, the disciplinic succession, which strictly follows the transcendental instruction, is the bona fide chain of disciplinic succession. And the test for such bona fide spiritual master is that there should be no difference between the instructions of the Lord originally imparted to his devotee and that which is imparted by the authority in the line of disciplinic succession. How Narada Muni distributed the transcendental knowledge of the Lord will be explained in the later cantos. It will appear also that the Lord existed prior to the material creation and therefore his transcendental name, quality, etc. do not represent any material quality whenever, therefore, the Lord is described as aguna or without any quality. It does not mean that he has no quality but that he has no material quality such as the modes of goodness, passion, or ignorance, as the conditioned soul has. He is transcendental to all material conceptions, and thus he is described as a guna. Over to you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. <coughs> King Parish. <coughs> Sorry. King Parishad inquired from Sudeva Goswami, how did Narad Muni, whose hearers are as fortunate as those instructed by Lord Brahma, explain the transcendent qualities of the Lord, who is without material qualities, and before whom did he speak? So this verse glorifies Narad Muni. Why? Because he comes directly in the disciplic succession. He heard it from Lord Brahma. Now, if you see your Bhagavad Gita, if you see the end of the introduction, but just an immediate page in my Bhagavad Gita is page number 31. It may differ to page 34. You see a disciplic succession, starting from Krishna to Brahma to Narada to Vyas, and so on, right coming down up to Prabhupada. So this is a typical disciplic succession. So any knowledge which is heard outside this discipline of succession is not bona fide. That's why Sri Prabhupada explains here that directly, sorry, Narad was directly instructed by Brahma. Narad spoke, I mean, Narad heard directly from Brahma. Where is the evidence? The evidence is given in Srimad Bhagavatam. We find in Srimad Bhagavatam, Narad was assuming that Brahma was all in all. And that Brahma is creating everything, and there's no one above Brahma. But then Brahma clarified everything. He says, No, about me is Lord Narayan. And all the way back to Krishna. So, this way, Narada directly instruct, was instructed by Brahma, who happens to be his father, and who directly, Brahma in turn was directly instructed by Krishna. The opening verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a line which says, Thene Brahma Adi Kavaye. Adi means first. The first disciple of Krishna is Brahma. So anyone who represents Krishna is bona fide. Now we find that there are people who pose to, uh, to be very learned, but really speaking, if they are not in disciplic succession, they may be very good orators, very attractive. But really speaking, it won't make any benefit to you. So we should always hear from a bona fide source. And a bona fide source is the one who is connected to, to the bona fide disciplic succession. <clears throat> we speak about, let me explain to you what is a disciplic succession. And I might have explained to you earlier, but I'll just repeat it. Let's say there's a beautiful mango tree outside your house and there are beautiful mangoes on the tree and the most beautiful mango is right at the top of the tree on the top branch so how will you get it down now there are ways of bringing the mango down one is by hitting with stones another one which using some instrument or 
trying to bring it down with a stick. No, all of this will damage the fruit. The wisest way to bring the fruit down the way it is, the mango, is to climb up. So a person will go up, he'll cut that mango, hand it down to another person who's holding a basket. And then it goes down till it reaches in its original condition. So this is this is the way Sri Prabhupada explains the disciplic succession. Disciplic succession means bringing the fruit down without changing it, with no alteration. And when it's handed to you, you can wash it, offer it to Krishna and eat it. And this is the way even the knowledge is given in that particular way. If you go to the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, in the <coughs> opening two verses, Krishna also emphasizes this succession. And if you see the opening verse, Ivam Vivashtate Yogam Patavam, let me just see the exact. Imam Vishwasate Yogam Pratavam Aham Apyayam Vivashwan Manave Praha Manur Ikshwakave Pravit. The Basnadi of God, Sri Krishna said, I instructed these imperishable signs of yoga to the sun god, Vivashwan. And Vivashwan instructed it to Manu, the father of mankind. And Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshwaku. In the verse 2, Krishna says, Krishna tells Arjuna, the supreme signs were thus received through the chain of disciplic succession. And the saintly kings understood, understood it in that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken. And therefore, the signs as it appears, appears to be lost. So what was the need of speaking to Arjuna? With the original disciplic succession was broken. And the original knowledge was mixed up. And the original essence was already lost. For example, 10 people are sitting in a room and you are supposed to speak by whispering into another ear, let's say a secret. So you speak like that. So that person will speak all of, will hear all of it. And he is told, okay, you speak to the next one and to the next one, to the next one. Now, in the due course, you'll find some words are gone. Because not everyone has a good memory. So, the original meaning was already lost. That's why new parampara had to start in the case of Arjuna. So, Arjuna is on the top of that parampara. There's a, there was a very big controversy. Sometimes people say, but Arjuna's name is not appearing this in this section. No, it doesn't have to. Because Arjuna is directly linked to Krishna. And what Krishna is speaking is the essence of the Vedic scriptures in the form of Bhagavad Gita. What was necessary, Krishna spoke. So in this way, a parampara has to be bona fide. A bona fide parampara means a bona fide discipline succession. Just like <clears throat> you do not go to people who are not genuine or you don't buy things which are not genuine. Just like if you have a doctor in whom you have faith, then even for a small sickness or even for a serious sickness, you'll always go to the same doctor because you have trust in him. So discipline section means without changing the original message. No changes. You can, it's very easy to interpret any message. And once it's interpreted, then the original strength is lost. We have discussed many, many times earlier that when this Bhagavad Gita was introduced in America, people became devotees, not before that. There were already 550 editions of Bhagavad Gita before Prabhupada went there in, in so many bookshops. And people read Bhagavad Gita, but they had a lot of respect for Bhagavad Gita, but none of them became devotees. But as soon as the as it is, like this is called Bhagavad Gita as it is, and as it is, it was introduced in the market and it was made available to people, to the universities, people started accepting and people changed. First time in thousands of years, at least last two centuries, nobody would wear a dhoti in America. But now they were, after reading this book, they started wearing dhoti. 
Ladies started wearing saris. They started putting tilak and so on. Kontibala, showing the original tradition, the Vaishnava tradition of presenting Bhagavad Gita as it is. Already in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, uh, sorry, Sri Prabhupada says, that one should hear Bhagavad Gita from a devotee of Krishna, not from anyone else. If someone is not a devotee of Krishna, don't hear the Bhagavad Gita. It may seem to be very, very attractive, but it can create havoc. <clears throat> the famous verse, <clears throat> milk when it's touched by a poisonous snake, then all the milk becomes poison. And if you drink that milk, you'll die. So we need to be very careful that the knowledge you are getting is from disciplic succession. So Narada is very fortunate to have heard directly from Brahma. And it is Narada, it is who, I mean, same, same Narada is the one who gave knowledge to Vyasadeva. So Vyasadeva, his spiritual master is Narada. Narada's spiritual master is Brahma. Then Vyasadeva gave it to Madhvacharya. And then later on it came down to Ishwar Puru is the spiritual master, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna himself. Then it came down, down, down. Now it has come down to Sri Prabhupada. So this is a typical disciplic succession. And that is the way of receiving knowledge. You don't receive knowledge by an experiment or by discovery, they call it. It has to be a descending, descending knowledge. Remember the example of the tree. The tree, the fruit is right on the top and then is brought down in a descending way. Not in an ascending way. There are two ways. Ascending means by testing, experimenting, so many things. Descending means accepting the knowledge the way it is. You're right to experiment, but you should accept the knowledge the way it is. So that is called a bona fide way of getting the knowledge. So this verse indicates Lord also existed before the creation. As the verse says here that how did Narad Muni, whose ears are so fortunate as they as those instructed by Lord Brahma explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord who is without material qualities and before whom did he speak? See the last line says before him, whom did he speak? It means Brahma, before Brahma is Krishna, from whom everything is coming. From by him, everything is maintained and in whom everything will rest. So this, this is giving the supreme position of Krishna. That means the Lord existed prior to the, to the creation. And Krishna is called Aguna or Nirguna. Nirguna doesn't mean no qualities. Nirguna means no material qualities. In, a, in us, we find so many material qualities constituted in the form of goodness, passion, and ignorance. As far as Krishna is concerned, he's above this. He's absolute. Everything about Krishna is absolute. Advaitam, Achyutam. Anadi, Adi, sorry, Advaitam, Achyutam, I forget the line. Krishna says, uh, sorry, Lord Brahma is giving the transcendental qualities of Krishna, which is quoted here in Bhagavad Gita. So when you read Bhagavad Gita, Advaitam, Achyuti, Anadi, means before creation, Ananta Rupam, Krishna has many, many forms. Adyam Purana Purusham. Adyam means the first person is Krishna. Purana means very old. Purusham, that means he is a person, not some imperson. Navi Yovanamcha. He is like a, a youthful boy. Vedas Dullabham. Even after studying Vedas, one may not understand Krishna because Vedas deal with three modes Satvagun, Rajaskun, Tamagun. You have to rise above that. But Adullabam Atma Bhakto, one who becomes a devotee, he can understand Krishna. Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Vajami. So Krishna is beyond the three modes. That's why Krishna said it's called Nirguna. Nirguna means 
the modes don't touch him. The more, even the mode of goodness is not there. Like in the demigods, there is mode of goodness, prominent. But Krishna is beyond the three modes. So if you go to the second chapter, verse number 45, Krishna advises us that the Vedas deal mainly with the subject of the three modes of material nature, O Arjun, become transcendental to these three modes, be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety and be established in the self. So in other words, we are supposed to go beyond the three modes of nature in order to understand Krishna. Does anyone have a clue why? Any, anybody likes to try? Anybody has any clue why we are supposed to go beyond the three modes of nature? As here hinted to Arjuna, rise. Anybody likes to try? Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Yes, Path Prabhuji. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we are above of the three modes of material nature, so that we can understand the good uh, Suddha Sattva, the transcendental knowledge, so that we can uh, able to know the relationship with Krishna. Yes. In other words, we have to come on that absolute platform. For example, in the 1855, it says, Brahma Bhuta Na Suchati Na Kanshati. In order to practice the devotional service, we have to come to the body, I mean, rise above the bodily platform and come to the Brahma Bhuta platform. Brahma Bhuta platform means absolute platform where there is no tinge of goodness, passion, and ignorance. Or in other words, it's purified goodness. That's called Shuddha Sattva, as Path Prema Prabhu explained. <clears throat> so if you come to that level, then you can understand Krishna. And to understand Krishna, the process is bhakti. By bhakti yoga, because bhakti yoga is also absolute. By practicing <clears throat> an absolute knowledge in a physical way or mental, intellectual way, we're using our senses. And <clears throat> as we purify, I mean, as the purification goes on by bhakti yoga, our senses become purified. And when you start serving Krishna with purified senses, that is called Bhakti Yoga. So that's the definition Sri Prabhupada gives. So as we come to the level of absolute, then that is called Aguna or Nirguna. Krishna is absolute. Bhakti is absolute. Krishna's name, form, pastime, qualities, abode, all those things are absolute. So one has to rise to the absolute platform. And when you do that, then you can actually understand who is Krishna. And to rise, there is no other way other than practicing Krishna consciousness. At that even, under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master. So, since Krishna is transcendental and transcendental through the modes of nature, even bhakti is beyond the three modes of nature. For example, like some things we can't get an answer, but yet the answer is there in the process itself. Like we all have a practice of chanting Hare Krishna. Now one may argue that, oh, you are chanting, but the name of Krishna can also be written on a paper. Rama, Hari, and so on. So how can you call it transcendental? Well, it is still transcendental. Whether you write it on a paper or a stone, or you speak it with your mouth, or you simply sing Hare Krishna, the whole mantra, it is all transcendental. So this verse or the purport aims at explaining, Sri Prabhupada explains very nicely, that because Narada had heard from his father, wherever he goes, he speaks about the transcendental qualities of Krishna. Narada Muni Bajaya Bina Radhana Ramana Radhe. It's a very famous song about Narad Muni, that wherever he goes, he plays his veena and he glorifies Radha Raman. Radha Raman means Radha and Krishna. In this way, wherever he goes, <clears throat> whatever he speaks is all transcendental. Just like if you open any part of the Bhagavatam, <clears throat> you'll find in most chapters Narad Muni is mentioned. He's mentioned so many times. Three personalities are mentioned again and again. 
नारद मुनि दैन व्यास जी एंड सुखदेव स्वामी एंड ऑफकोर्स महाराज परीक्षित देर नेम्स कम अगेन इन अगेन बिकॉज द होल डिस्कशन comes many many times and narad muni is right on the top because he's just next to lord brahma and giving out this knowledge of devotional service and uh, the mysteries rahasya means mysteries science of worship of radha and krishna so narad muni distributes this transcendental knowledge as you read bhagavatam you find how does it distribute it is distributed to very small children young boys like dhruv and pralad <coughs> pralad was in the womb dhruv was 5 years old but yet narad muni taught him then many adults were taught many sages were taught valmiki was taught by narad nirgari the hunter was taught by narad so any knowledge which comes from narad is bonafide because in this discipline succession and whoever is in this discipline succession is bonafide <coughs> just like i think about 3 4 days ago uh, <coughs> we celebrated the one called the disciples day of shila baldev vidyabhushan he is in the discipline succession and if you open your bible gita his name is mentioned in one page here shil prabhupad dedicates this book to him he says to shila balde vidya bhushan who presented so nicely the govind bhashya commentary on vedanta philosophy let's go a bit into the history about 500 years ago or even prior to that there was a mughal rule in india and many temples were broken even in vrindavan they started breaking the temples so all night the deities were taken away from there and taken to rajasthan and one of the most famous deity is radha govind ji the deity of shri rupa goswami and rupa goswami had the biggest temple radha govind ji temple a seven story building a seven story temple <clears throat> and when aurangzeb broke it started breaking it the deity was taken by man singh to jaipur and from that day on was the deity was still worship by godia uh, godia mat vaishnavas the bengali devotees they had to worship for years no one day it was visited by devotees of south india of the shri sampradaya the sampradaya which comes from ramanujacharya and he said how can they worship they are, they are not bonafide so when the king asked why are they not bonafide he said they don't have a commentary on shrimad bhagavatam their own commentary because all other disciplic successions paramparas had their own commentary so now the king was i may became very very uh, morose that who will worship he said no now our devotees will worship so the godi vaishnavas were not happy so they approach baldev with the apushan what to do so what did well well baldev with the apushan do to write a commentary takes minimum 2 to 3 years it's not an easy thing see he had no other option but to speak directly to krishna and now one thing you should note that any acharya in the discipline succession they can actually speak to krishna they are not like us they are very pure very much connected to him so he spoke to govind ji radha govind ji jaipur even today is there and he prayed that we have no no commentary but we follow the commentary of shri the swami it is acceptable but now they are demanding a new commentary means as per your as, as for godia vaishnav where do i get it and he became very very what he called He was praying and praying, and he went to sleep, a slightly a nap, and the Lord appeared and told uh, Balde, "Wake up, take your pen and start writing." So he took a pen and he started writing. Govind himself, Govind himself, started dictating. 
and the whole commentary was written till morning. In the morning, the commentary was shown to the king. And the devotees from the Sri Sampadai, when they checked the commentary, they were taken aback. They were shocked. How can this commentary be written? It has no flaws. So perfect. And they bowed down. Not only that, they all took initiation from Balde with Abhushu. So that shows a bona fide representative of Krishna. For example, like Prabhupada, he's directly connected to Krishna. <clears throat> and not only he was, he is connected to Krishna. Otherwise, how can he bring so much literature for us with no flaws in it, no mistakes? You find it's perfectly written in a very simplified, not yet Prabhupada claims that it is not he who is writing, it's Krishna writing, and with the help of the entire discipline succession, is all the acharyas have helped him write the commentary. So in this way, if we have faith in the discipline succession, which we should scrutinizely hear, read, practice, then even we can join the parampara and become the representative of Krishna or Vyashtev or Narada, or Brahma himself. And thus doing, we can help so many people. Why people are suffering? They are not getting original knowledge. There's a verse in Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, I think it's verse number 10. Vitta Raga Bhayakurta Man Maya Bhavashri. In that verse it says, the people in the past, they freed themselves from attachment, anger, and fear and engage in my service, and they attain love from me. So Krishna tells Arjuna, they have already done in the past, you do the same. Now if you read the purport, in a section, there is a section where Sri Prabhupada gives the point of fear. Why does fear come in the person? Because he doesn't have right knowledge. One of the cause. But once he has the right knowledge, he becomes fearless. Where do you get the right knowledge? is from the parampara, not otherwise. And if you read in many places of Bhagavad Gita, uh, parampara is quoted by Sri Prabhupada so many, many, many times. So why should we hear from parampara? Is that is we are 100% sure that whatever is written is authentic. And we, we should not jump away from the parampara. Nor should we speak out of parampara. Now in India, it's very common that they have a kind of a habit of creating something new. Yes, you can create something new, new presentation, but the knowledge should not be changed. We have no right to change the knowledge, but they altogether change the knowledge. That's why the whole Sanatan Dharma is put into a chaos. So who helps? Put it back is the discipline succession. I'll read you a section which is in the seventh chapter, verse number 24 of Bhagavad Gita. He's quoting from Ramanuja Charya. So, Prabhupada himself is explaining uh, Ramanuja Charya's words. He says, <clears throat> Those who are worshippers of demigods have been described as less intelligent. And impersonists are similarly described. Lord Krishna in his personal form is here speaking before Arjuna. And still, due to ignorance, impersonists argue that the Supreme Lord ultimately has no form. Yamanacharya, great devotee of the Lord, in the separate succession of Ramanujacharya, has written a very appropriate verse in this connection. He says, my dear Lord, devotees like Vyashdev and Narad know you to be the personality of Godhead. By understanding different Vedic literatures, one can come to know your characteristics, your form, your activities. And one can understand that you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But those who are in the mode of passion and ignorance, the demons, the non-devotees, cannot understand you. They are unable to understand you. However, Experts such as non-devotees non may be in discussing Vedanta and the Upanishads and other 
Vedic literatures, it is not possible for them to understand the personality of God. So here Sri Prabhupada quotes Yamadachari, who is directly in the civic situation in Sri Sabadai from Ramanujachari. And one more example I can give you of the civic succession is in the time of Rama. I might have given you earlier, but I just repeat it. Ramanujachari's favorite disciple, Danudas, approached Ramanujachari and asked him that Prabhu explain to me what does Krishna mean by saying Sarva Dharma Paritajya. Well, the basic meaning is give up everything, surrender to Krishna. That is okay. But what is the inner purport? And Ramanujachari said, the inner purport of this verse is that surrender 100% to your special master. If you do that, that is called Sarva Dharma Paritajya Mahamekam Sharanaja. The special master's lotus feet have so much potential that they can drive away all the inauspicious things from your life. Also in Chaitanya 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 Mahabharata explains, Radha Krishna Das Kavaraj explains, mm -hmm. that when one takes initiation, then all the sins of the disciple are taken away by the spiritual master. So from that day onwards, he gets a new birth. And if he practices Krishna consciousness diligently as advised by one spiritual master, one is guaranteed to go back home, back to God and guarantee. So real meaning of Sarva Dharma Paratajam is accept a spiritual master and follow his instructions 100%. If you, even if you can't follow 100%, at least 90% should be there. If you follow it, then the guarantee is you'll go back home, get back to God. And in this very life, that's for sure. So that is the way, if you obey your spiritual master, you be, obeying the spiritual master means obeying the rules and regulations of the scriptures. And whatever, if you have a living spiritual master, in this call we have living spiritual masters also, if they give you advice and tell you to do something, you have to do it. And you should do it, making it, it your life and soul. Then you become a successful devotee. You'll deliver yourself, you'll deliver also others. So it seems to be very simple, but the practice becomes very difficult. Because while practicing, we are, there's a tendency we become overcome in two ways, either by illusionary energy or by pride. Sometimes the illusionary energy will cheat you. You become attracted to something else other than Krishna. Or sometimes you become too proud and that pride ruins you. <clears throat> because the only this is the only, what do you call, uh, obstacle in our devotional service. It becomes a big obstacle that you can't move forward. The disciplic succession never gets destroyed. Remember that. But you won't make any progress if you're puffed up. Or you are, you forgot to Krishna engage in the illusion energy of Krishna. That's why Krishna says, this illusion energy of mine is divine, consisting of the three worlds. It's difficult to overcome. But one who surrenders can easily cross beyond it. So remember, remember the words of Krishna. Remember the words of Srimad Bhagavatam. Remember the words of the Acharyas as they give you. And they actually help you in any situation. Sometimes you're in a situation where you're confused to what to do whether to go lie, right or whether to go left, you are in a kind of a dilemma. So at that time, go to the speech master and ask what to do. The speech master, if he's pleased if with your humility and with your devotion, he'll give you the answer. Okay, do like this. And you realize that speech master is so pure. And because of his purity, he's recognized by Krishna. This you can hear in the conversation between Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramananda Rai. So many discussions. It reveals all the truths you require to practice Krishna consciousness and even beyond. Beyond means beyond Krishna consciousness. He's, of course, it does come in Krishna consciousness. He's to directly serve 
the gopis, and the gopis are serving Krishna. You go so close to Krishna, all that is possible. So don't give up your Krishna consciousness, chant your rams, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, try to understand the purport of today, the importance of discipline. The whole purport is aimed at explaining the purport, I mean, the importance of disciplic succession. Hare Krishna. Time is up. If you have any questions, you can ask. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Prophet, for today's session. You really took us on um, back to Chapter 4 of uh, Bhagavad Gita on the transcendental knowledge and giving us the qualifications of um, uh, the spiritual master and the qualifications of a devotee as well. Um, and then you took us through the uh, darshan of Govindji in Jaipur. Thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, I, I recently went there and it really brought memories back. So thank you for that. I open this up for any questions or comments. Are there any questions or comments for uh, today? Roshi, since there are no questions or comments, I have a question, but maybe not relating to today's subject. Um, mm. Uh, so when when you are in the material world and when you become a when you are aspiring to be a devotee, you realize that uh, you lose interest in the material world and it doesn't seem as sweet as before. Uh, and then you are not so you are, for example, this is the material world and this is the spiritual world. You are in between, so you you do not enjoy the material world, but at the same time you are not yet connected with the spiritual world. So what happens uh, during that time? Or how do we catapult to the spiritual world? And how do we protect ourselves by falling back into the material world? Yeah, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say you have a very nice white clothes, white dress, yeah? And it gets a stain. You feel very bad. So how? what do you do? You don't throw it away because you can't get it another one. So you get a soap, you wash it. It can't come out. You may use some chemicals. It may not come out. But by doing it again and again and again, you'll be able to remove that same forever. <clears throat> so according, as per your question, when you're practicing spiritual life, you lose interest in material life. That is obvious. Because you, are, you know what is real and what is unreal. Or in other words, you know what is permanent and what is impermanent. The material life means your, your responsibilities in the family, in your job, uh, money, your children, and so on. Now, all these, as per Vaishnava understanding, though they are in material world, but they are related to you. So you should be concerned with them. Don't say, okay, now I become a devotee, so I don't have to care for them. No. Your duty foremost is to take care. One simple example should probably give one lady devotee who had given a birth to a child. And the child was about a few months old, came to see Krishna Prabhupada. And she said, Sri Prabhupada, since I've got the baby, I cannot practice Krishna consciousness nicely because I could go to the altar and serve Krishna. Sri Prabhupada says, no. Taking care of your baby is more important then taking care of the altar. This is the answer Sri Prabhupada gives. So responsibilities are very, very, they should be given a first priority. That I hope my family go, because you don't, when you become a devotee, you're going to go back home. But now you don't go alone, you take all of your family. Unless they become very, very, what do you call, opposing or negative, then that's another thing. But if they are favorable, take all of them back to Krishna. Then Krishna will be more happy because he didn't go alone. He went with so many uh, other people. So though you lose interest in material life, that does, does not mean that you do not care for your material life or you take material life to be zero. No. Whatever responsibilities are there in your material life, do them. 
do it in such a way as per the Shastra, that even those who think that it's a waste of time, they will value your spiritual life and they will also become devotees. If not at once, in the due course. I've seen many families. In any family, there's one good devotee. The whole family becomes devotees. That is for sure. Does it answer your question? Yes, Prabhuji, but I'm, uh, I, I'm also asking about, um, so this person who he doesn't like the material life anymore, but yet he has not um, attained uh, the right qualifications to enter into the spiritual world. So he's in limbo, he's in middle of material and spiritual world. So what does he have to do to go to the spiritual world? I understand that he doesn't have to give up his responsibilities. He has to do whatever he has to. But how does he increase his inclination to the spiritual world? It's by valuing the Krishna conscious process. When he says he's in a limbo, it's nothing wrong. Even while he's in a limbo, if he, he doesn't have to give up his practice. I explained in many, many classes, the practice is like waking up early, worshipping your switch master, worshipping the deity, sorry, chanting around, then you worship your deity, worshipping Tulsi, offering prasad, boga to Krishna, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. This minimum practice is if he follows, he or she, he will in due course become purified. He won't be in a limbo anymore. He will be with Krishna. Though he's living in the material world, if you go to the fifth chapter, I think it was number nine, uh, Krishna gives the example of a lotus leaf. Lotus leaf is clinging to water. But the moment you lift the lotus leaf, no water will touch you. The devotee lives in the material world, but is actually is living with Krishna. So he should not be worried, nor should he feel guilty, whoever it is, but should diligently follow the process. What is the power of Krishna consciousness? It's not becoming a devotee, but practicing your Krishna consciousness day in, day out. Do you have Bhagavad Gita in your, with you? No? If you go to the 1426, this verse answers all the questions. When Arjuna is asking the question, how do you overcome Maya? How do you overcome Maya? And this is the answer Krishna gives. Let me read for you. 1426. The second last was of the 14th chapter. Mam chove bicharini bhakti yoga na sevate Saguna Samaitan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpati. One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahma. Brahma means absolute. Absolute means Krishna also. So if one wants to stay in that platform, whether you like your devotional service or you don't like your devotion, you do your duties. That's it. You finish your rounds, make sure you don't skip your rounds. Make sure you hear Bhagavatam. Make sure you eat only Krishna Prashadam and associate with devotees. Pay respects to the deity. Remember, uh, Remain surrendered at the feet of your spiritual master. These are enough to take you back home, back to, back to God. Is it okay? Yes, there is a little time in between. We feel uneasy. We also feel guilty. Am I doing properly? But this was answers. But I am doing it daily. Anyone who remains steady in Krishna consciousness, he will overcome all those obstacles, all those darkness, all those dark patches of his life, and all those holes in his heart. <laughs> they'll become full, and the heart will become full of love of Krishna. Okay. Okay, Prabhuji, thank you so much. So that's fourteen twenty-six. Yeah. I uh, hand over to Pat Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Yeah, thank you Prabhuji for your nice class. Prabhuji, uh, according to your class, uh, it is important also, also you describe today, this is a discipline success and discipline success and like, so that we can understand. 
But uh, uh, when we are uh, go through the other scriptures also, also many instances like Surdas, like uh, Balaram Das in Jagannath Puri, they have no any spiritual master, but they are attending this you know, supreme abode, the transcendental position. How it is possible? There is no way you can attain the spiritual abode without the mercy of other devotees. Not possible. So whether you say any devotee, they must mm -hmm. have had contact with a pure devotee. Other is just impossible, not just possible. Because when you reach the spiritual level, they'll ask you, who sent you? So you have to they have the answer. For example, like I die, okay? I die. And let's say my soul is able to go to Vaikuntha, they'll ask me, who sent you here? Then I have to speak the name of my spiritual master. And his spiritual master, and his spiritual master, and his spiritual master. Again, the dispute succession has to be there. If someone didn't have speech master, <clears throat> then nobody can become a devotee. Everyone, anyone who has become a devotee means he has had mercy of another devotee. In the Nectar of Devotion, Rupa Goswami says two ways one can become a devotee. One is practice of the previous life. That means in previous life, he had a speech master. Then he can practice devotion service. Another way is the mercy of another devotee, a pure devotee. Then one can practice uh, devotion, so not otherwise. So we have to take the words of Rupa Goswami, who makes it very, very clear that without the mercy of another pure devotee, one cannot become a devotee, number one. So what to talk of going back on back to that? No, you can't go there. Is it okay? Yes, Prabhuji, yes, yes. That's why we value Vaishnavas. Sometimes mm -hmm. we are not in good terms with Vaishnavas, but within our heart, we should have full respect for them. Whether you like them or you don't like them. Because not everyone mm -hmm. can be your friend. Also. Sometimes there may be some friction, there may be some negative attitude, but that should not uh, taint your spiritual life. No. Within your heart, you have to have respect. Because every devotee, has love for Krishna. Okay. Okay, Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prabhuji. And also thanks to all the devotees who are assembling here in this Bhagavad forum. So I request everyone, please unmute yourself and chant Hare Krishna mantra for a glorification of his grace, Rukma Prabhuji. Please join. <clears throat> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.